Paul began this discussion in chapter 12. We're chapter 12. He, he seems to take a break in 13, but not really because he's still dealing with the issue at hand and the abuse of, of the charismatic gifts, and then particularly how, how that's working itself out in worship. And so in chapter 14, he's uh, given the first 25 verses sort of a theology of the use of charismata. And now in verses 26 on down to the end of the chapter, he is saying, and look what's happening in, in your worship. Bad enough to abuse the spiritual gifts. When you're doing that in corporate worship, it's confusing, offensive, it's antithetical to the evangelistic discipleship mission of the church. What you're going to see today is that Paul is basically charging Corinthians with chaos in worship. It should not be chaos in worship. One, one ditch you want to stay out of. Ditch of chaos. We don't have that here. Another ditch you want to stay out of. Lethargy. Read from a passage in Matthew 15 where Jesus was quoting Isaiah. It says, they, they honor me with the lip. They're doing lip service, but their hearts are far from me. And I, and I pray that when you read that, oh, this week when I was going, making preparation, I prayed, dear God, please, may my heart be into this. Let me be guilty. Finding myself going through the motion, sermon preparation, sermon preaching. God, find my heart. Two ditches. Stay out of lethargy. We approach this time as passive. The other is chaos. This we get today, uh, where where it just sounds like a parakeet cage at the zoo. Corinth sounded like apparently. What we're going to do is we're going to look today for the second time. We just introduced it last week. We, we took the, in the Lord's Supper, when you come together, those first words in this, introducing this passage, which I told you then, there is a, uh, there's a sanctified assumption. People who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ and have joined themselves to a local body will be found coming together habitually when the saints come together. Paul just says that. We looked at that last week. We're going to ramp up a little bit today as we look at the second part of this. Find 1 Corinthians 14, verses 26 to 33 in your Bibles. Please, if you don't have a Bible with you, uh, we really want you to have your own, but you've taken thought, perhaps you've gotten here somehow without a Bible, or you don't have one yet. We always put this material on the screen. I don't want you simply to hear the word read. I want you to hear it and see it. In fact, you'll notice in the course of our worship every Lord's Day, we don't want you simply to hear it and see it. We want you to say it, and so we read aloud. Stand with me if you would and follow along as I read 1 Corinthians 14, verses 26 to 33. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If anyone speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Just read together what? 
the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. We need to ask the Lord to help us to have our hearts open to what He's teaching here so that, so that even though we might not be afflicted like Corinth is, that we will learn the lessons that need to be learned here, one of which is that, that worship is to be carried on in an orderly, engaged way. God help us be found such people. Thank you. Please be seated. So we're going to break this section down, this verses 26 through 33, the first part of verse 33, uh, under four heads. First, the reality of chaos in corporate worship as it has to do with Corinth. Based where we live, that has not ceased. There's chaos in corporate worship all around us. In every town that surrounds us. And in this town as well. Secondly, instructions for the manifestation of tongues in corporate worship. Third, instructions for the role of prophesying in corporate worship. And then finally, the character of God should shape corporate worship. I appreciated the songs we were singing this morning pointing to the greatness of our God. It is true. It is true that when we come into this place, we have an audience of one, God himself. And while I'm always interested that that what I'm doing here is edifying and instructive and encouraging and sometimes challenging and perhaps sometimes in a rebuke fashion and admonishing. Uh, and while I'm concerned that the gospel of Jesus Christ be set forth and that you recognize that and receive that and benefit from it, my primary concern is what does God think of what I'm doing? Audience of one. While you should recognize when you come together that you are, you're not sitting here by yourself, you're not an island unto yourself, you're part of a, a communion of the saints if you're a follower of Christ, and you should, you should be looking out to the needs of others. We're going to start looking at that when we finish 1 Corinthians. You need to remember first and foremost, what does God think of my worship? And that's not happening. Let's look at it. Reality of chaos in verse 26. What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. That, you've, you've seen that term, building up, throughout this whole discussion of the charismata. You're not given grace gifts. You're not given the spiritual gifts when you're born again in order to bless yourself. You're given them to bless others, to build up the body of Christ. We said to you back then, we were looking at chapter 12. We should be asking ourselves, first of all, have I identified or asked someone else to, to help me identify the spiritual gifts, the cluster of gifts that God birthed in me when he gave me the new birth by the power of the Holy Spirit? And if so, am I consciously, intentionally using these grace gifts, the charismata, to build up this body of Christ? Now you say, That's... I don't feel so good about that, preacher. Well, that's, that's okay. That's okay. You, know, the, the, you don't have to stay there. <laughs> you can seek the Lord. Who has, who has a greater interest in you recognizing the grace gifts he's given you and who has a greater interest in you using those to, to be a blessing to the local congregation where he's planted you to his glory and for the good of others. He has a much greater than, than you and I have. So we, we should always be considering that. I want to ask you to serve. I want to, no, no, don't do that. Not in my wheelhouse. Oh, true. 
But I would, I would hope the first response <laughs> would be, let me uh, pray about that because I do want to be found as a servant. I'm not against servanthood. Good place to be if you're a follower of Christ. <laughs> See, how can I use my gifts? And then I would hope that you would get excited enough and, and bold enough about your discovery, increasing discovery and reminders of how God has gifted you, that you would you would go out and say, you know, I, I think the Lord is wanting me to use this this way, bless body. Now that fires up a pastor. Okay. Reading in Don Whitney's book, looking at tonight, but uses a statement in there that when you approach some people, uh, I think it's about scripture memory, he says you think you would approach them about volunteering to face Nero's lions. Sometimes that's true of service in the church as well, isn't it? So that things be done for building up. That's, that's going to be the, the motive for believers in exercising the charismata in the life of the congregation. Now, what he's saying here, basically, when he talks about these items, a hymn would refer to a, to, a, to a reading from the Old Testament or perhaps a singing one of the Old Testament psalms. That's what would have been uh, in, in their context. Paul wrote this letter to Corinth. A lesson is probably, I think teaching is what some of the uh, versions say, indicates a, a doctrine, a doctrinal lesson that someone wanting to share, to, to edify, to build up. Now, you would know as well as I do. You've been around people, and I pray to God that I don't appear to be one of them, that who seem to want to share to let you know how much they know. <laughs> That's not what he's talking about here. That's why he says, let it be done for building up. And then there's this uh, a revelation. At this time, remember... The New Testament canon, the New Testament scriptures have not been completed, so there was still revelatory things coming up where God is teaching uh, through, through his uh, prophets and his people. And then a tongue, and this is interesting here because he seems to use, I told you that the general principle is that when you start reading in chapter 12, that he's making a distinction between a tongue and tongues. Tongues meaning the legitimate manifestation of that particular gift, the speaking, the gospel, the truth in different languages. And then when he says a tongue, that, uh, that it seems to be a counterfeit of that. He's using the word a little differently here. Because he certainly not is, at, is not at this point saying, now even though speaking in an unknown tongue is counterfeit and illegitimate, when, when it happens, and no, he wouldn't let it happen. He wouldn't allow for it to happen. So he's using, this is a different use of the word tied to foreign language. Then an interpretation. If someone speaking, just imagine for a moment. Say we do actually see these Haitians here in our lifetime. That actually happens. Somebody slips up at the embassy in Haiti and actually gets them through. Uh, and Pastor Joseph didn't show up on the Sunday that they were here. Pastor Denny got up and with all his might began to preach the gospel. Well, once I get beyond bonjour, I'm kind of dead in the water at this point. I cannot translate for him. Can you imagine? Now, I want another scenario. Suppose Pastor Joseph shows up with him. And so Pastor Joseph, in terms of the interest of time, wanted to let Pastor Denny preach as much as he can. He is, he is translating in English at the same time that Pastor Denny is preaching in Haitian. There's a word for that, cacophony, chaos. Paul is, is pressing for, for order here, a tongue or an interpretation. So what you get the picture is happening, we're going to see it in a minute, is, is that this was going on nearly simultaneously. And, and they, were, they were fussing and fighting over space. <laughs> Time, if you please. You know, you might call it pulpit time. They were, they were fussing, fighting 
over who was going to get heard Corinth. So he, uh, he basically is concerned, just as he shared it earlier in this chapter, 1 Corinthians 14, 23, if therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues, and in the context of what we're talking about, tongues, lesson, a hymn, interpretation, that's all happening at one time, and outsiders or unbelievers enter, which you always pray God will be bringing and you'll, you will be inviting people into our midst who are not yet follow. Will they not say that you are out of your mind? That's Paul's assessment of what things look like at Corinth. People are crazy. You appear to be crazy. Lunacy will not advance the gospel. That's his concern here. So Paul says, let all things be done for growing up. And uh, recognize this term building up, by the way. We need to remind you. We talked about this before. It is a Greek word which means literally means house building. House building. How would you like? My, uh, my grandparents used to talk about them barn raising barn raising or you might get a together and somebody needed a barn maybe it burned down or was falling down they come together as a community build this nice barn so they can their 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 hay and livestock and things what was you invited to a barn raise your best your part to put this thing up in a timely way you spotted me over there all hammer Knocking joists down. Huh. Now, well, did you participate in the barn? <laughs> well, I sure did. Not for building up, well, tearing down, undermining. Paul's concerned about that happening. In, in so he 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 is thinking similar to the way he thought. He wrote in Ephesians. We studied this in Ephesians chapter four, verse eleven to twelve. He gave. The apostles gave some of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. These are gifts of God to the local church to equip the saints. There's that, that empowering us and, and, and discipling us for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. That's you don't cultivate a gift, you don't ask to be mentored, you don't get discipled, or that you can feel better about yourself. That's can be a greater useful building up the body of Christ. And while that, that passage in Ephesians says that, that he gave these gifts to the church in order for that to happen, don't take that to me. Well, that's the pastor's. The pastor's supposed to be building up. We're called, I should make it happen. Every believer is called to be an edifier. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.11. We're just going to take a couple of passages here. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So there's a, there's a one another issue there. You do that to someone, someone does that to you. You build one another up, one another. 15, 2, and 3. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. That may have reference to where, where you live, but the idea here being neighborly and context of the life of the church is Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. He took, he took it for us. Matthew 28, even man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for me. I'm always concerned when I visit people, uh, maybe they've come here as guests or maybe down with them, they start saying, I just, so what is, what's, what's your church got for me? Church got for my kids. A whole lot of church. Christ followed. Come to be served. So Paul is concerned that there's a there's a turning in Corinth that. Inward. I almost played a clip this morning. 
I just Ryan Regan. Oh, too intense. See, Paul is telling Corinth that, that there's an evidence among them. This is all through the 14th chapter. There's a selfishness. So it manifests itself in an immaturity that appears to be loveless. But they don't, they don't love the brothers. You want to put congregation in a deep free, remove from its presence, practice, love one. Listen to what he says. Just just cite, mind you, in 1 Corinthians 4. Kids will tell you, we sure have been in this a long time. I don't want to get so we're going to back through some. 1 Corinthians 14, 3 to 5. On the one hand, one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. One who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. The one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you to all speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. One who prophesies is greater than the one who interprets, so that the church may be built up. Built up, built up, built up. Chapter 14, verse 12. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestation of the Spirit, I have to excel in building up the church. 17th verse. For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. 26th verse. Say, what then, brothers, when you come together, each one has this, 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 let all things be done. Then at the end of this, toward the, you can all prophesy one by one, so all may learn. Paul's concern is that that's not, that's not the temperature of Corinth. That's not the mindset in Corinth. Somehow they've gotten the notion, and I, I Perhaps it comes out of their culture, of a very indulgent culture. They bring that into the church and think, it's really all about me. You're here. Because we're here for him. Vertically. The more we're here for him, the more we're living for his glory, whatever we do, eating, drinking, all the glory of God, then the more. Paul had commanded the Romans, and this is something that the Corinthians don't be aware of or take seriously. In Romans chapter 14, verse 19, he said, So then let us pursue what makes for peace, for mutual upbuilding. Can you imagine history of a church? That's what conduct makes for peace, therefore slaying controversy, find it in the center. Mutual up. Because you see, that which builds people up always also promotes harmony. Just as that which is selfish promotes. What is the primary tool? We're looking at it tonight. Scripture, the Word, Bible intake, the Word to can exhort one another. Scripture, we share the Scripture with one. Oh, have you ever things you could reading such and such? This I thought of you. Build one. Another. See one another and greet one another. Tell them what encouragement. Word of God is the tool. That's what Paul was saying to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable. All Scripture is profitable. Profitable for teaching, proof, correction, righteousness. Purpose, the clause there, in order that may be complete Whipped for every good work. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like building up to me, like encouraging. Well, secondly, let's look at this here. This instructions. Now that he's sort of laid that verse down, is what happens when you come together? 
not saying that approvingly. He's not saying, I'm so glad to hear that when you come together that you're fussing and fighting one another over who gets the first word and who gets the last word, the longest word. Instructions for the manifestation of tongues in People ask me, have you ever been concerned about someone standing up and speaking in tongues and you're preaching in the context of work? There's a clear prescription in the Scripture how to handle it. Find out immediately that that was by God, motivated by the Corinthians. Verses 27 28. Many speak in a tongue, that there be only two, or at most three, each in turn, and let someone interpret. All right, right there, folks, right there. I want to superimpose that on most of what happens in the world of charismania and bah, disqualify. Walk into a place where there's, where there's a number of people at the same time standing up, speaking in, in non-intelligible, multisyllabic. That is not, not taught anywhere in Scripture. And it came out of the Corinthian mystery cults. It has more in common with the prophets of Baal. You can't appeal to the Scripture. That conduct, Paul dismisses that, disallows it right here. But if there's no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent. In here's the here's the principles he lays down. Four of them. Two or three persons should. They should speak in turn. There's never any reason for more than one person, congregational setting, speak. The language not commonly recognized by fact. There's no reason for speaking the common language of everybody there. Speak in turn. I don't topple one another. What they say should be interpreted. Remember, Paul is thinking here with the idea of a language not previously. Perhaps God has did this. I mean, naturally enabled it in the area of dialect. And Why would he do that? Just that be an attention getter, get people's attention. What happened at Pentecost? a huge heavenly tension game. You better believe this is different. So, at a time, and there should be an interpreter there. Someone's asking, what would happen if someone popped up in the middle of a service of Bethel and to speak in Well, if this, well, let's start well, they did it in English. Hold that thought for a minute. We'll deal with that later on. But if it's in a language that we're not recognizing, I would immediately say they're an interpreter. Failing to have an interpreter. According to the scripture. Can you doing is not authorized? If no one's present to it, rocket sign. Yet, then some can use these principles completely ignored. In the name Glossolalia, in the name of speaking in tongues, in the name of being filled with the Spirit. I have no doubt people who do this in those settings are filled, filled with a Spirit, not the Spirit, not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who Jesus said he will, he will not speak of himself, he will not draw attention to himself, 
He will testify of me. Everything that's done in work. Everything in life should glorify God. Everything done in worship should point people. I and live. So they weren't doing that. Paul lays down what I think are very clear expectation. They're divinely appointed. He's writing under divine inspiration. He's not putting a gag order. We're going to look at this same idea into the next section. Not putting a gag order on anyone. Not saying the preachers can talk. He is saying that what happens come into the presence of God he is the audience. Anybody that anybody that does any orderly way draws attention to himself or herself, trying to take the place of the audience. God does not share his glory with anyone. You have that on the idea of the tongues. Then this instructions for the, for the role of prophesying in corporate worship. It's very interesting. He's made it very clear here from chapter 12 all the way up to this point. Prophesying is, is, more, is superior to tongues. Uh, it it's, has a tendency to edify. But even Paul, Paul wants to know, even in prophesying, you can be abusive. You can undertake that gift which he says be great to see that manifest. And you can abuse it. And so Paul is here not so concerned to put down tongues and to build up prophecy. Here he is talking about what corporate worship looks like. Worship that glorifies God. So listen to what he says here, verses 29 to 32. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. So he's anticipating in the, in the congregation there will be people who manifested the gift of prophecy. Could be in terms of telling forth truth. But it's also because remember, Scripture has not been written. There's also revelation going on. God's revealing truth. It says, let the others weigh what is said. There's, there's a measure. He anticipates that the congregation at Corinth, though fairly newly formed, had an understanding, a good enough understanding of biblical truth, biblical revelation they had thus far, to know if what a person was saying was coming from God. Revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. In this case, one who may be sharing a revelation, if another says, I have a word. Now, the commentators I was reading on this said probably what he's talking about here is, is if someone's giving a revelation in terms of a, a telling forth of a truth, some, a truth that they, they would know to remind them that one has a revelation, a new word from God, a person telling the truth that they knew should yield a person who probably what's you can all prophesy one by one. He says, everyone has, will have the opportunity. You've been given the gift of prophecy, of telling, telling things. Have the opportunity. But, three. Basically what he's saying there is, if a several decide that they, how they, have order, have a fire hose on truth that here's the drive, here's what's the focus, here's the test. So that all may learn. Did you learn more about God? Did you learn more about the, the reality of God? Sin? Gospel? Learn more about the person who had the revelation. That I've heard some folks' testimonies that are about are ninety percent sinner and ten percent God. All about them and this and that and the other. Back on God, change me. Make it God centered. Spirits of the prophets, subject to. Them. So, 
unpack this quickly. Have the gift of prophecy. Then have with that a discernment, recognize what is being. Big picture of spirits of prophets, subject to prophets. No, no prophet go on if if others who have the gift of prophecy in the midst say. But another aspect of this is the individual aspect of this. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. There is not this out of control, slain in the spirit stuff that goes on that you can call manifestation of the spirit. A person who has prophetic utterance never loses consciousness as his eyes roll in the back of his head and starts speaking under control of his faculty the whole time. Again, mystery cults around in Corinth had the ecstatic expressions. I think what's going on here contextually is that these folks were coming out of that into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, probably genuinely saved by grace, and yet all the only experience they had to draw on was what they came out of. And Paul is trying to distance them, trying to help them in their sanctification. Lay that, to put it aside, to not be childish about it anymore. Don't bring that into the church of the Lord Christ. There's no place for it. These folks running around, and you've seen them on TV or YouTube, maybe take their coat off and swing their coat, and the whole front row falls back. That has nothing to do with the Spirit of God reigning in a place. There's a spirit there. Not a spirit you want to follow because Paul is pleading. And also, we recognize that the idea of prophets. Prophets first to go by the wayside. And he says in Ephesians 2 20 that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus when you get to the pastoral epistles, 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, he's talking about officers in the church and prophets not even mentioned. Here's because the role of prophet was a foundational development of the church and birthing of canon scripture. Prophecy falls by the way. Revelation. Paul, by the way, right when the canon eat when put writing, holy men carried along by the Holy Spirit. That then ceases the necessity. Pastors and teachers, evangelists, the offices of deacon. These are what is to nurture the church that's been birthed by these other movements. Wrap this up. Last thing. If I've confused you today, come talk to me. We'll try to sort it out. The character of God should shape corporate work. God is not a God of confusion, but superimpose that. When your life is a believer, you come among others, do you... Do you promote the peace of God, the peace of Christ, that reconciliation between, between you and God, holding that out for others to be reconciled to Him, promoting reconciliation in your own relationship? Is that happening in your home? See, is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Is He the Lord of your home? If He's the Lord of your home, you're promoting peace, not chaos, submitting, yielding to Him. You're a peacemaker, not a fire starter. In the church, you know people, and I know them too, whose MO, whose mark and trade, whose, whose almost basis for boasting is how disruptive they are in the life of a church. I know people, I've met them, will boast to you on how many preachers they've run off. There's nothing the Spirit of Christ that is upon that. 
God is a God not of confusion, not chaos. Peace. Simply ask you, brother, that peace comes first when you know that you were a sinner, hell bound, who've been rescued. Prince of Peace has come to the place. Not only a peace. Attitude builds up myself being of others. That's, that's the presence of that's the mark. Anybody get enough money together to put up a building and put people on it, call it a church. Anybody can do it. But inside that it takes a Author, constant prayer of failing belief. Oh God, make me an instrument of your peace. My teaching, may my service, may my, my relating have about it the aroma. That way in Corinth. Isn't that way today in a lot of Yet that is the model. Character of God superimposed upon worship. Whether it's corporate worship, whether it's family worship, whether it's your, your individual devotional life before marked by an absence of Paul wants for every one of us should be called Lord of Peace, God of Peace in 33, the Lord of Peace, give you peace, Second Hebrews 13, closing, but may the God of Peace, he birthed it in you. Cultivating the means of grace, these spiritual disciplines are pressing upon one another on Sunday. And then juices that flow from that be peace, righteousness, joy, delight in the people of God, to be with the people of God. Used to be gotten away from that, that life, fill up things, calendar, make you think. Gotten in a habit, as I was talking to you, being here because you rather than waiting, saying, Lord, I come to the Lord's day to worship you, my lips, oh, may my heart act. to meet you. And when I, when I come that way, and I know there are others around, heart to meet you. May our hearts connect increasingly. Go down. God willing, we're going to look That in through worship, always. Tell what you witness stirs in you. Our prayer for me. 
not in danger here of falling off into the but it is a danger all around. Doing holiness, author and our faith that before at the cross. Despising its shame. Behind you. People need to look. Our heart beating for what your heart beats. Our eyes weeping over what grieves you. I was Being the means of seeing you bring many sons and daughters to glory. Holy Father, your God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that hold before you today. You're the God of peace. Jesus is the Prince of peace. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of peace. Help us, Lord, to be instruments. Recognize and worship that it must chiefly Untaken, collective of the God. We will recognize we cannot contribute to being peacemakers in, in corporate life if we're not here. Our absence of peace if we all these lessons here of our heart. Gripping our minds, grabbing hold of our feet, hands, our mouth, our ears, moving up. Be who you would have us be. Glorifying you. All that we do in We ask it in. Stand in.